sometimes I think of that with the day that I got saved, you know, uh, the more I tell it, the more wonderful it is. And, uh, and it's exciting to think about. Well, let's take our Bibles together. If you will, please turn to Genesis 37. Genesis 37. And uh, this is the third part of our series here on the life of Joseph. Uh, I'm sure we'll have quite a few parts because uh, there's a, a lot to his life here. Uh, but Genesis chapter 37, I'm sure that uh, many of us are familiar with the story of Joseph. And uh, we've seen already how he came up. Uh, he came uh, from a real messed up family. Just a fact of the matter is uh, his family had a lot of problems and uh, there was a, a lot of favoritism played in his family. We looked at that last time when we saw how uh, Joseph was given that coat of many colors uh, as really a sign that he was going to have that to place of prominence in the family. He was going to be carrying on the, uh, the name. He would have that birthright. And, uh, and so uh, there was a lot of turmoil in his family because he was not the oldest brother. He was not the oldest of the sons, uh, but his dad uh, saw him as his favorite. And so it caused a lot of problems. Then Joseph had these dreams. And uh, we talked about that last time. He had this dream and that dream. And these dreams seemed to come from God himself. Um, and Joseph whether or not he should have, he did, shared those dreams with his family members who got really upset because the dreams seemed to indicate, and they do indicate, that Joseph would one day rise to such a place of prominence that everyone else would actually bow to him. And, uh, and so he shared that dream, and uh, nobody liked him as a result. Not that there's a big surprise to that, uh, but uh, he shared that dream later on. Uh, that would come true, and uh, it would be a confirmation that God had planned it all along. And just a thought on that, you know, we may not understand it now, but God plans it all the way through. And you might think, boy, my life has been up and down. I've had this problem and that problem, and, and it just doesn't seem like this is a very good deal for me. But we know that God has a plan. He's in control, and he is working things together. And not only for your good, if you love him, if you trust him, but also for the good of others. Our stories are bigger than, than us. I think that's something that we learn in the story of Joseph as well. Well, last time we left off in uh, verse number 11, where Joseph had finished telling his story of his dream. And his father, as you will recall, kind of got upset about that dream even. And, and uh, he said in verse 10, uh, his father rebuked him and said, What is this? <laughs> what is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come and bow down ourselves to the, to the earth? And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the same. So his father kept it, uh, almost wondering, what is God going to do with my son? Well, now we pick it up in verse 12. And his brethren went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. Uh, now, they had lived in Shechem before, and they had some turmoil there. Uh, in fact, uh, it was the men of Shechem that uh, were killed by um, Joseph's brothers because uh, they had uh, raped their sister and it was just a messed up situation, and, and uh, you can uh, jump back there and read about that. But uh, Jacob and his sons uh, were well known in the area, and uh, they were feared in the area. Nobody messed with them because of what they had done. And here they take their, their flocks and they go to feed them in Shechem. This is about two days' journey from where they were in Bethel there. Uh, and so they, they had traveled quite a distance. And whether or not this was uh, at the design of dad, uh, Jacob, or whether or not this was their own design, we're not sure. It seems that Jacob was old at this point, And so he most likely had given over most of the responsibilities to his sons uh, for the family business, which, which was uh, raising sheep. And uh, so they took the flocks to Shechem, 
about a two days journey away. For whatever reason, Joseph was not with them at the time. So we pick it up in verse 13. And Israel, that's another name for Joseph, uh, or I'm sorry, for uh, Jacob. In fact, uh, we talk about the Israelites because they were the children of Israel. Okay, So Israel, the new name God had given to Jacob. So it says, And Israel said to Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, I will send thee unto them. And he said unto him, Here am I. And he said unto him, Go, I pray thee, see whether it be well with thy brethren and well with the flocks, and bring me word again. So he sent him out of the vale of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. Uh, If you remember, this was the pattern (laughs) as recorded earlier in the chapter where Joseph would give the report, and uh, the evil report, in fact. He would tell his dad if his brothers had been doing something wrong, and so he would go tell his dad and, uh, and try to keep things together that way. Because of that, he was not well esteemed by his brothers. They didn't like him. And so now Israel has the same idea. After these dreams, Jacob says to his, his son Joseph, hey, I want you to go again and... Uh, He doesn't say spy, (laughs) but go see how they are and bring me word again. And uh, and so Joseph goes on this mission. Um, I wonder what Joseph was thinking for those two days as he was traveling. You know, how's this going to go? They already don't like me. Uh, They didn't like it when I gave that dream. And they didn't like me because dad gave me this really nice colored coat and, uh, and they don't like me because I'm the favorite. And they don't like me because I, I keep telling dad about their evil deeds. Uh, and so here he goes. I find it interesting, though, that he seemed to be obedient. He doesn't protest here. When dad says, son, I want you to go and see how your brothers are. He doesn't say, dad, I, I'd, really, I'd really prefer not to do that. Thank you. Maybe he was thinking that, but he doesn't say that. In fact, he says a great response here. Here am I. Here am I. I'll do whatever you want me to do. I think that's a great example. You know, from time to time, we'll see in Joseph a type of Jesus Christ. And I could almost imagine what it was like in heaven when God the Father says to his only begotten Son, I need you to go, I need you to become a human. I need you to pay the death penalty for these sinners. And uh, I don't think Jesus protested. Uh, I I think he was ready and willing to do what his father called him to do. In fact, we, we see evidence of that when Jesus prays in the Garden of Gethsemane and he says, Father, not my will, but thine be done. And so uh, perhaps this is a a picture of that Jesus uh, going uh, to into what would be a harmful situation for him, uh, but at the Father's bidding. Here Joseph does the same, and he says, Here am I. Of course, when I see those three words, Here am I, I think of Isaiah too. Don't you think of Isaiah chapter 6, one of our favorites, one of my favorites anyway, uh, where God says, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Uh, Who's going to go and tell people about the truth? Who's going to go to the Israelites? Who's going to go and proclaim the good news? And Isaiah says, here am I, send me. And then God goes further to tell him what he's going to be doing. Uh, And and in fact, God tells Isaiah, it's not going to go well. They're not going to listen. They're not going to listen. But I need you to go and preach anyway. And so sure enough, he goes. Uh, And there may be some times when God calls you to go and do something. And you think to yourself, this is not going to be good for me. Well, remember, there is a bigger picture. And your life is about more than just you. In fact, God has a plan that is greater, vaster than what you could ever imagine. And there are more involved in his vast plan. And so you and I, as a, as a piece to his puzzle, you and I, as a tool in his hand, you and I must submit and say, okay, God, wherever you want me, whatever you want me to do, I will do it. Uh, from time to time, I remind myself of commitments that I've made to the Lord. And I have to say, all right, Lord, if you want me to be 
your doormat for other people to walk all over, I'll do it because I want to serve in whatever way you want me to. You know, God has a plan. And what we must do is submit to that plan. And so here, Joseph says, here am I. Here am I. His father says, okay, go, I pray thee. Uh, See whether it be well with thy brethren. Uh, Notice the word, I pray thee. It's interesting. It seems to be not just a demand, but a request. A request. You know, I ask you, would you please go? And Joseph perhaps knowing it would not be good for him, he goes anyway. And so he sent him out of the Vale of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. So here goes Joseph, traveling two days' journey, comes to verse 15, and a certain man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, What seekest thou? And he said, I seek my brethren. Tell me, I pray thee, where they feed their flocks. And the man said, they are departed hence. For I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. And Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dothan. So he gets all the way uh, to Shechem. And notice there's not a whole lot of uh, the dialogue here for us. But this guy sees Joseph wandering in the fields and he asks him, he approaches him, what are you looking for? And Joseph doesn't even seem to introduce himself. He says, I'm looking for my brethren. I think uh, his brethren, that family was well known in the area because of things that they had done before. And everybody knew who they were and everybody knew where they were going and where they were. (laughs) And so so this uh, this guy says, oh, yeah, uh, I heard him say they're going up to Dothan. So uh, Joseph follows them to Dothan. This is probably another day's journey away. So now he's about three days' journey away from dad. And uh, and he goes all the way to Dothan. Dothan uh, seems to have its name uh, from a cistern or two cisterns. Um, And perhaps uh, one of those cisterns will be in use in a little bit here as we continue the story. Um, But a cistern, like a, a well where the water would be stored, in fact. And so could it be that they needed some more water? There must have been a drought or something. And so they decide, let's go to where those two cisterns are in Dothan. Go up there and get some more water for the flocks. And so that's what they do, and that's what Joseph does as well. Verse 18, when they saw him, let's see, did I read verse 17? Uh, And the man said, They are departed thence, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. And Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dothan. And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. Wow. They They didn't even want to hear what he had to say. They look out and they see him coming at a distance. How did they know who he was? Probably the coat he had. <laughs> I mean, he's wearing this nice coat that he had gotten from dad. And they look out and they, oh yeah, I know who that is. And they see him. And here he comes, sporting that nice jacket <laughs> that he'd gotten from dad. Uh, and, uh, and so this favored son is coming at a great distance off. And they all look at him. They know who he is. And they conspire right there. Nobody runs to see him. Hey, Joseph, good to see you, buddy. They don't do that, you know. They think, oh boy, uh, let's figure out what we're going to do before he gets here. And so they come up with a plan. You ever feel like, you ever feel like everybody's against you? <laughs> that's, the, that's the situation Joseph is in here. Everybody's against him. Uh, and he's all alone. He's in this situation and, and everything's caving in on him. And now he's, he's trying to be obedient. He's just trying to do what he's supposed to do. And he knows that uh, as he approaches, he knows his brothers are, are not going to be really favorable. And uh, in fact, they are conspiring against him. Uh, they want to do everything they can to destroy him. In fact, what's their plan? Kill him. Kill him. They conspired against him to slay him. Now, you and I, have a very real enemy. And that enemy conspires. Uh, During this pandemic, 
and, and with everything else going on, election and all that stuff, there were a lot of conspiracy theories floating around. A lot of people have a lot of conspiracies, conspiracy theories. Uh, and, and we seem to be just always looking for the inside scoop. You know, somebody's got a plan. Somebody's doing something. And, uh, and I don't know what plans there are, but I do know this, that there is one real conspirator, and that's the devil. And he has a plan to destroy your life. But I do know this as well, that God knows a whole lot more than the devil does. And so even in your life, when it seems like things are caving in and everybody's against you and the system's against you and the world's against you and everybody's against you, do not be afraid. As Jesus said, be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. And so when you and I have Jesus on our side, we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to worry about the conspiracies against us. And we may be approaching a, a challenging situation and wondering uh, how it's going to work out and thinking that everybody's against us. Don't worry. God is in control. You can trust him. And so Joseph keeps taking those steps, even as he watches his brother. His brother's kind of, you know, grouping together, conspiring against him. Verse 19, and they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Yeah, this guy who thinks he's an expert in all these dreams. Here he comes. Come now, therefore, let us slay him and cast him into some pit. And we'll say, some evil beast hath devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. Isn't that interesting? What were they afraid of? Are they really afraid of Joseph? I don't think so. They were afraid of his dreams. They heard his dreams. He told them his dreams. And evidently there was some evidence in his life that gave evidence to his dreams being true. I think they were afraid that God really did give him those dreams. They were afraid that maybe, just maybe, God did have a plan that was bigger than them, that would place Joseph in a place of prominence above them. I think that's what they were afraid of. They were afraid of God actually doing what he said he was going to do. And by the way, if you find yourself on the opposing side, that is opposing God, you better be afraid of him. Because he will do and he will accomplish what he says he's going to. You know, the, the, the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. <laughs> it's time for us to respect God enough to say, you know what, he can do anything he wants to do. And, uh, and I don't want to find myself on the wrong side. I want to be on his side. I don't want to be against him. I want to be with him. I want to work with God here. Uh, and, and, and so here, uh, this, this situation, I think they're afraid that God's actually going to fulfill that dream. That they were convinced, it must be, they were convinced that that dream came from God. And so they were working against God. So they come up with a plan. <laughs> we can best God. We can, we can control this situation. We can work this out. I know what to do. And so they come up with the plan. All we got to do is kill Joseph. And then those dreams will never come to pass. It's easy. Just kill Joseph. And so that's their plan. Verse 21. And Reuben heard it. And he delivered him out of their hands and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said unto them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand upon him, that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. For whatever reason, Reuben, uh, the, the firstborn, gets it in his mind, this is not a good idea. Killing our brother is probably a bad thing. Maybe we shouldn't do that. And so... He goes to his brothers and, and tries to convince them, don't, don't kill him, don't kill him. Now, it doesn't seem that Reuben tells them the plan. Uh, Reuben doesn't say, hey, just leave him in the pit and I'll come back later and take him and give him back to dad. <laughs> I don't think he tells him that part of the story. I think he just says, let's not kill him. You know, let, maybe, 
Maybe we'll just leave him in the pit. He'll, he'll die of thirst or something. But let's not us shed that blood. You know, that, that wouldn't be right for us to do. So, uh, so he, he tries uh, the best he can. Well, maybe not the best he can. But he tries uh, to protect Joseph in this way. Um, and, uh, and his plan was evidently to come back later and uh, gather him up and send him back to dad. Um, they don't seem to listen to Reuben. Uh, Reuben doesn't seem to have very much leadership. Even though he was the firstborn, uh, he had made some big mistakes already. And, uh, and it seems that he had kind of forfeit his leadership position and nobody quite listens to him. Uh, maybe they, they don't kill him, but he knew that he couldn't convince them or didn't try to convince them that killing, them, that killing Joseph was bad, that they ought to send him back to dad. Uh, he wasn't going to tell him that. And uh, he kind of lost his leadership uh, capabilities there, or, or influence rather, uh, in the family. So Reuben said, shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness and lay no hand upon him. And now we have this part, that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. Verse 23, and it came to pass, when Joseph was come unto his brethren, that they stripped Joseph of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him, and they took him and cast him into the pit, and the pit was empty, and there was no water in it. And they sat down to eat bread. So they, they throw him in the pit. All right, Reuben, you know, we'll just throw him in the pit. And, and we don't know what happens to Reuben. Reuben evidently leaves. Um, I don't know what the, what the plan is. Did he go to uh, take care of the sheep in some responsibilities or something like that or whatever it was? But Reuben leaves and they throw him in the pit and then they sit down to eat. Uh, and so while they're sitting there eating, they're, they're thinking, what are we going to do with this guy? They've taken his coat off of him. Uh, that might come in handy later on, which it would. Uh, for their plans anyway. So they, they, leave, they leave him there in the pit and they're trying to think and come up with a plan. So verse uh, 25, they sat down to eat bread and they lift up their eyes and looked and behold a company of the Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels bearing spicery and balm and myrrh going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said unto his brethren, what profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood. Evidently, they still had it in their minds they were going to kill him, even though Reuben had talked him out of it initially. That must have been part of the discussion as they're sitting there around the, around the, the, the food uh, and, and eating. Part of the discussion must have been some of those brothers saying, hey, I think we should kill him. You know, let's get rid of this guy. And so uh, here we have uh, a new leader standing up, Judah. Uh, who evidently has some influence. We can see uh, Judah even beginning to show signs of that leadership. And of course, later on in Scripture, we would see that Jesus himself would come from the tribe of Judah. And it was the tribe of Judah uh, where the kings of Israel would come from, the leaders of Israel. And Judah seems to be taking some leadership here. He says to his brethren, what profit is it if we sl slay our brother and conceal his, his blood? You know, why, should we, why should we do this and, and then try to hide what we've done? I don't want to feel guilty like that. I, want, I wonder if Judah's thinking that. And so he convinces them to do something. Verse 27, come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him. For he is our brother and our flesh and his brethren were content. Uh, Judah seems to argue from a standpoint of what is moral here. He says he's our brother. He's our flesh. We shouldn't kill him. We shouldn't kill him. It's not right. Let's not kill him. Instead, let's sell him. <laughs> okay, great. Great. Good job, Judah. Uh, let's sell him instead. Now, I, I don't know if maybe uh, Judah had uh, some other plan, but at least uh, he stood up to prevent the murder of his brother. Uh, but, uh, but he says, let's sell him to the Midianites. Uh, and, and so we see that verse 27. Let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, our flesh. And his brethren were content. And there passed by the Midianites, merchantmen. And they drew 
and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and they brought Joseph into Egypt. I wonder what that was like. Can you imagine just being one of those brothers? And they, and they lower down this rope or whatever it is, and they, and they pull Joseph up out. Maybe Joseph's down there, not sure what's happening out there. And he's thinking, oh, finally, you know, they've come to their senses. They're going to rescue me. Uh, maybe, maybe Judah was able to convince him. I don't know if he overheard any of the conversation at all, but, but they lift Joseph up out. And then soon after that, they tie him up, I'd imagine. They tie him up and they sell him to the Ishmaelites. Can you imagine what Joseph must have been thinking and, and how he must have been protesting? Guys, I'm your brother. You can't do this. What are you doing? What, why are you tying me up like this? Why are you? This is horrible. Guys, don't do this. Just let me go home. Now, he's a young man here, uh, probably a, a teenage, a late teenager. And, uh, and so, you know, 18, 19 maybe. Um, he, at the beginning of the chapter, he was 17. Maybe he's a little bit older now. Uh, but here he is, a, a, a teenager. He's begging and pleading with his brothers uh, to protect him, to, to not to do this thing. But they sell him. They sell him for 20 pieces of silver. Well, that reminds you of something, doesn't it? When Jesus was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver by Judas Iscariot, sold in that sense, and Joseph seems to be a picture of that as well. Here's Joseph now sold. Uh, later on, it would, uh, we would see in, in the book of Leviticus that uh, the, the price of a young slave would be 20 pieces of silver and a mature slave would be 30 pieces of silver so uh, he was just this young slave that seemed to be the good good price and uh, I don't know I imagine they haggled they probably did that they still do today haggle over prices and they probably haggled and came to that uh, price of 20 pieces of silver they agreed there and then they sold Joseph into Egypt. Wow. Now it would be years and years and years before Joseph would ever see his family again. You know, you look at a life, uh, a story like this and see what Joseph went through. Betrayed by his family, cast out by his family, cast out by everybody that he loved and cared for. Maybe you've experienced something like that. You've been abandoned or something like that. And, and, it's, and it's tough. It's hard. And Joseph was in that kind of a situation, but God had a plan for Joseph. And God protected Joseph from death. And God sustained Joseph for his plan to even protect his family. And I, I find it amazing. Sometimes we can get so burdened down by what we're going through that we don't realize the incredible things that God may be doing with us. It's important for us just to yield ourselves to him. Say, God, whatever it is you want, whatever it is you want, um, I'm willing to serve. Uh, I'm, I don't think it was just or right. It wasn't a good thing what happened to Joseph. There's a lot of injustice in this world. There's a lot of unrighteousness in this world. Things aren't right People say, if God's so good, if God's so loving, why has he let these bad things happen? Well, I may not be able to answer the specifics of your, of your questions, but I can tell you in this situation, this bad thing happened to Joseph, it would turn out to be a very good thing because God would use him to save people and deliver people from death. Nations. And so... Why does God allow these things to happen? This injustice in the world? I can't tell you. But I know that God is good. I know that he has a plan. And I know that he's in control. And I know that I can trust him.
whatever it may be. We can trust him because he's got a bigger plan. Well, we're going to stop right there. Next time we'll pick it up in uh, verse 29. Uh, So let's go ahead and pray, and uh, then we'll get into some other things here in just a moment. Our Father, thank you for showing us that you have a plan. I pray that you would help us as we try to deal with the injustices in our own lives and in this world, in this society. I pray that we would be able to see through those things and just to trust you no matter what happens. May we cling to our faith in Jesus Christ and find that you are good. May we not be afraid, but recognize that you have overcome the world, and so we can trust you and depend on you through each of the challenges in our lives. Help us to draw close to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.